Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Bryant, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide for a smooth recording. If you have te technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our upcoming webinar, our next webinar is on uh, May 4th, and that'll be how to analyze genealogical sources with James Tanner. And that'll be on Monday at 4 p.m. If you'd like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we're pleased to hear from Hannah Bell, who will be giving a presentation on First World War internment camps. Hannah Bell moved to Scotland from Canada seven years ago and lived in Wales first before moving up to Scotland. She has been working at the Scottish Borders Archive as their genealogy registrar for the last five years. She also works for Archaeology Scotland under their Stubbs Camp Project as digital archivist. And Hannah actually pre-recorded her webinar for us today. And so let me just share that with you. And then she's going to join us at the end for questions and answers. And so if you have any questions, post them in the chat box and she can address them at the end. But let's get started. Hello, my name is Hannah Bell and I work as a digital archivist for the Internment Research Centre, the Stobbs Camp Project, based in Hoyk, the Scottish Borders. I'll be giving you an insight into life in internment camps and exploring some of the sources which you can use to discover more about these camps. My primary focus is the British Empire. However, many of the sources can be used when researching camps more globally. So let's get started. Britain declared war on the 4th of August 1914 and the day after passed the Aliens Restriction Act. This new legislation allowed the British government to control the movement of the citizens of countries which were at war with Britain. This control included where they could live and where they could work. All enemy aliens, as they were called, were required to register with a local police force and by the end of August 1914, there were 50,633 Germans and 16,141 Austrians registered. Some had been living in Britain for years, while others were visiting for business. Those who lived in Britain were working in the hospitality industry. They also worked as butchers or bankers, and we even have records of a chocolatier. On August 7th, the decision was made to begin interning them. Whether someone had been living in the country for years, was visiting for work or a tourist. No one was spared. Any enemy alien could be arrested and interned. Under the new internment system, men between the ages of 17 and 55 could be held indefinitely without trial. Those civilians under the age of 17 and over the age of 55 were not deemed as a threat, so were not interned. Their experiences varied from returning to Germany to staying in Britain. Two main waves of internment occurred in October 1914 and May 1915, which coincided with the outbreaks of anti-foreigner violence during which German-owned property was looted and destroyed. In some cases, Germans and Austrians were arrested for their own personal safety, although the official line was that the measures had been taken to safeguard the nation against internal spies. Despite the wholesale civilian internment did not begin until 13th May 1915, after the sinking of the passenger liner Lusitania. As you can see in the images, on the far left, we have two sailors. In the middle, we have a gentleman in German military uniform. And on the right, we have two men in civilian dress. So it really was anybody who could be interned. Along with internment camps in Britain, there were also a series of internment camps located throughout the British Empire 
which is shown on this map. The link at the bottom of the page will take you to an interactive map, which we are continuing to update. The map includes the various camps we have identified and the dates that they existed, with the numbers of civilian internees and prisoners of war, if we know them. We are working on including more detail, but as you can imagine, with around 500 camps, it is a big job, so volunteers are always appreciated. Roughly 50,000 civilians were interned throughout the Empire, including 30,000 in Britain and a further 20,000 in the colonies and dominions. The numbers are unknown for prisoners of war. This is an example of the website itself, Camps in the British Empire, and it looks at camps during the First World War, and then we will hopefully eventually add the Second World War as well. If you look at the map itself, you can see all the little blue dots are where camps existed. That's Britain, so it gives you an idea of the scale that there was with all the camps. If you go further out, you can see they are all over the world in all of the different places in the British Empire. We've also, if we find really good research guides, we also attach those at the very top. So you can either click on a prison internment camp and it will give you details at the left. It gives you the abbreviation that was in the International Red Cross index cards, the dates of existence, the type of camp, the type of prisoners, if we know the numbers and where it's located, and then significant notes um, where they were transferred to when it closed or other information like that. The other way you can use it is you can actually search for where you live. So if you search for, let's say, Hoik, for example, it gives you the example there. And when you click on it, it'll take you to Hoik. then gives you any camps that are in that area there you can click on them and it'll give you the information about them so we only it's only information that we know that's actually recorded here and the prisoner numbers they're all they're estimates they're always estimates so that's how the website itself actually works internment camps existed in various forms across the country Race courses, police stations, barracks, ex-army camps, jails, and even hotels were converted into holding facilities. Over time, these smaller temporary camps were closed in favor of larger camps established to hold these enemy aliens. So far, we have discovered around 500 camps, including work camps in the British Empire. A majority of these were in Britain. These numbers do not include the small groups of prisoners who might be sent out to work on farms or the many facilities who only held prisoners for a short time. The drawing on the right is of Fort Napier in South Africa, and the picture on the left is of Stobbs Camp from a different angle. The treatment of internees in British camps was usually fair, but the monotony of life there, separated from family and friends, worrying about businesses and livelihoods, and with no idea of when you might be released, was very damaging to mental health. This was described as barbed wire disease. Severe cases were moved to local asylums for treatment. Other men committed suicide either from barbed wire disease or from the shame of being captured. In response to this and to try and minimize damage, civilian internees and prisoners of war designed activities to keep themselves busy in past time. These activities varied across the camps. They included writing and producing a camp magazine, organizing sporting activities held at the camp recreation grounds, forming orchestras to give concerts, performing plays, providing education through lectures on anything from practical skills like agriculture or bookkeeping to foreign languages and libraries. Several organizations, including the Quakers, the YMCA and some German groups, were allowed to help them by supplying equipment such as textbooks, books, and instruments. We have evidence at Stolf's camp that the camp magazine, which included articles written by internees, 
announcements of events, and a game corner could even be subscribed to by individuals not at the camp. The magazine had to pass through a censor before it was published, and there is only one edition that was never printed. Unfortunately, copies were destroyed and we don't know why it was censored. The images here are of a play produced in Ruhlhaven. The gymnastics team from Stobbs Camp and the title of the Stobbs magazine, Stobbs Yada. Most of the civilian internees and prisoners of war were men, but what happened to their wives? This is one area which we would like to conduct further research. We have learned that many German-born women and children were deported back to Germany as they were not seen as a threat. Pictured here is a group of women who were interned in South Africa after being deported from its neighboring countries. Interestingly, German-born women living in South Africa were not detained. British-born women who had married Germans also suffered, often disowned by their British families and unable to return to Germany. We don't know exactly what happened to them. Were they sent to Germany? Did they remain in Britain? How did they survive after the head of the household was interned? What about their children? We have come across some of their names in the poor law records, but the records that exist about them are very patchy. Let's take a look at some examples. Stolp's camp located near Hoyk in the Scottish borders was previously used as an army training camp. Around the 2nd of November 1914, the first civilian internees arrived at Stolp's. The internees were held in part of the original army camp until new huts were built. The locals helped in their construction until they went on strike for higher pay. The war office responded swiftly and a hundred royal engineers arrived the next day to finish the job. The strike ended and the locals went back to work on the same rate of pay. A report given by Mr. Edward Lowry of the U.S. Embassy gave the following statistics. Stobbs housed 4,616 prisoners, of whom 1,829 were soldiers, 504 sailors, and 2,283 civilians. Of the civilians, 2,098 were Germans, 181 were Austrians, three Turks, and one Bulgarian. The camp occupied roughly 55 acres, and there is no evidence to suggest segregation between the nationalities, though there were four different compounds that existed. After April 1916, civilian internees from Stobbs and other camps were moved to a large camp at Nokelo on the Isle of Man, which is located in the middle of the Irish Sea. Stobbs camp then became a prisoner of war camp and continued in this role until the end of the Great War. Templemore is located in the Republic of Ireland, but until 1949, the P Republic was still part of Britain. Templemore is located in the south between Limerick and Dublin. The Richmond Barracks in Templemore had been identified as a suitable location to detain German prisoners of war. It was inland and had limited traffic connections, making it harder to escape. Though there were escape attempts at other camps, most were recaptured. Templemore, like many others, began as a civilian internment camp, but quickly changed to a prisoner of war camp on the 10th of September 1914, with the arrival of 400 military prisoners. The civilians were moved to Old Castle in County Meath and the Isle of Wight, then they were transferred to Nokelo on the Isle of Man. The captured soldiers and their guards soon settled into a comfortable routine, and there were no reported escape attempts. The prisoners were well fed and accommodated, and one commented to a policeman that it would take a good many bayonets to get us out of Templemore Barracks. Despite the ongoing war, a warm and friendly relationship had developed between the prisoners and the local townspeople. However, in March 1915, a decision was taken to move the prisoners to England. The prisoners of war were moved to a new camp called Lilford Mill at Ley in Lancashire. One of the camps in the British Empire was Barima Camp, or Annenschloss, in Australia. It was located in a local jail. It was cleaned up and made secure upon the arrival of the first group of internees in March 1915. Unlike various other camps, internees here were only locked up at night. Once they had completed the morning roll call, they were free to roam within this area, but must return for the evening muster at 5 p.m. They were allowed to purchase supplies from local stores, and some even rented accommodation nearby for their families. The internees 
here had a very positive relationship with the people. They saved the Barima school from a bushfire and created a garden with a flotilla of canoes on the Winga Karabi River. By 1915, the fame of the Germans' bridge, huts and gardens had spread. People would come to sightsee, swim and picnic. This kick-started the first tourist industry in the area. Later on in the war, in August 1918, they were transferred to Malonglo. In South Africa, the government ordered all German officers and reservists aged 18 to 56 to be arrested. On the 13th of August 1914, the order was expanded to include Austrians, and on the 26th of September, it was changed to include all enemy aliens. In October 1914, nearly 2,000 internees were moved to Fort Napier. Fort Napier was the main camp and held up to 2,600 prisoners. The camp was made up of ordinary ranks and civilian internees from the working class. It also included women and children who had been deported from Southwest Africa, Rhodesia, the Belgian Congo, and German East Africa. Though the women were released in June 1914 and deported back to their countries where they were held under house arrest, the men remained at the camp until 1919. From civilian-only camps like Nagelo on the Isle of Man, camps that held women like Fort Napier in South Africa. Great diversity existed. The treatment of the prisoners was just as diverse. In Burima, they were allowed to leave the camp during the day. A few miles away in Hallsworthy, guards would taunt and shoot at the internees. So where do you start looking? and How do you find information on these camps? Just a word of caution before you start. There are countries that have changed their designations and their names. Today we would all say that Newfoundland is part of Canada, but it did not appear in the records of the Canadian First World War Internment Recognition Fund. When I queried this with a colleague, he explained that during the First World War, Newfoundland was not part of Canada. It was under British rule. However, it can still be found in the International Red Cross Committee records. Another example, Rhodesia, no longer exists, but is now called Zimbabwe and Zambia. So there are several anomalies like this. It's always worth looking into the history of a place before you start trying to find out about internment camps that existed there. A good place to start is with the International Committee of the Red Cross, or ICRC. During the war, the ICRC maintained contact with all warring parties and employed hundreds of people to help reconnect prisoners of war from both sides with their families. In addition, the ICRC undertook visits to prison camps to ensure detainees were being kept in acceptable conditions, visiting 524 prison camps in Europe, Africa, and Asia. Within a year, the ICRC grew from just 10 members, mostly volunteers, to 1,200 staff. Due to its status as a neutral and independent humanitarian organization, throughout the war, the ICRC passed on reports of violations of the laws of war as defined by the 1906 Geneva Convention and the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907 to the state concerned. In most cases, an investigation was launched into the accusations, but the outcome depended on the individual states. The ICRC also protested against inhumane treatment of prisoners and civilians living in occupied territory. At the end of the war, they continued to play a role and were involved in the repatriation of prisoners. In total, the ICRC assisted around half a million ex-prisoners before the official end of the ICRC's repatriation operations on the 30th of June, 1922. They have made some of these records available online through their website, Grand Guerre, which is listed on the slide. I'll go into this a little more in my second talk towards the end of the year, but one of the best resources the ICRC has compiled is their database of around 6 million index cards that contain information about 2 million individuals, just a portion of the total who were killed, imprisoned, or went missing during the war. The index cards that they held on prisoners of war have been digitized and are now available online through their website. These records mention names, military details, transfers, home addresses, and much more. They are a very rich 
resource when searching for an individual, but they can be a bit tricky to use. The Stobbs Camp project is currently using this database to establish the names of those interned at Stobbs Camp. Pictured on the slide are some examples of material available through the database, and they all relate to Otto Newdig. The three cards on the left are all index cards that list his name, date of birth, where he was captured, and various other details, whereas the list on the right is his main list entry, and it gives his address and next of kin. Having a close look at your local newspapers from 1914 to 1919 can tell you a lot about the war experience of the area you live in. Just like today, they are used to report on important current events. Newspapers mention the arrivals of the prisoners of war or civilian internees, visitors days at the camps, or other activities that took place there. If you do find something, it is always worth looking further afield at some of the more national newspapers to see whether different facts were reported by them. As you can see in the Kelso Chronicle of the 6th of November 1914, it describes how they are getting Staub's camp ready for the German prisoners, converting it from an officer's training camp into an internment camp. They mention the death line made of barbed wire. The second example of the Kelso Chronicle on the 31st of August 1917 mentions several escaped prisoners and offers descriptions of them in some detail. Bernhard Hack, Naval Chief Petty Officer, age 28, height 5 foot 10 inches, stooped slightly, fresh complexion, fair hair, grey eyes, tattooed on right forearm, dressed in naval uniform. It goes on to describe his five companions and warn that they may have changed clothes by now. In the Sunday Post on the 30th of September 1917, our final example, the heading reads, is Search Party Scours Hills. It again describes several prisoners who have escaped and how search parties were out looking for them. There were mixed feelings about the influx of the Germans. Some people viewed it as positively purchasing handicrafts from them, whereas others likened it to trading with the enemy. Still others viewed it with curiosity and would go on sightseeing trips to see the Germans and the internment camps. Prisoners and civilians internees often made artifacts to sell to the guards. They could send this money home or use it to purchase items from catalogues or local people. We have examples of carved toys, vases made from bone, and impressive marquetry panels. These objects would often end up in museums, and as you can see from our example, they have carved the name of the camp into them with the years. The archives may also contain information on the camp, but don't be surprised if your local archive has only briefly heard of the camp. Many have disappeared from the landscape and have also disappeared from memory. If there are no primary records of the camp, like posters or camp newspapers, check alternative records, local committee minutes, community council minutes, diaries, postcards, police records, administration records, and local government records could all hold information. The Internment Research Center, which was launched in November 2019, hosts the map that was mentioned earlier. It has a large library collection of material written by experts around the world and also contains a large collection of digital material. Through the Internment Research Center, two education packs have been published, which are free to use on prisoners of war and civilian internees experience, both in Britain and in South Africa. These archives continue to grow and we hope they continue to grow for years to come. This is Stobbs Camp today, and as you can see, very little remains of the camp itself. You can see where the buildings used to stand and where their foundations used to be. And there's the one hut that still stands. Today, many people remember Stobbs as a place where they learned to drive and had to do a hill start on the hill that you can see in the background. Official records kept by the War Office tend to be held at the National Archives. In the case of the British Empire, it is always worth checking the National Archives at Kew for records since London would have been overseeing the war effort at the time. 
These records contain appeals for release, reports of camp inspections, details of food rations, and various other special cases, which were deemed important enough to be addressed at the national level. They usually contain correspondence relating to the case and the subjects and the official decision that was taken. This is one of my favourite types of sources. The letters and diaries are rare and generally did not survive, or are kept by the family, the few that did are fascinating. These give a great insight into the lives of the prisoners of war and civilian internees. They have first-hand accounts from those who were interned during the First World War. Postcards are also an excellent source because of the images that they hold. Though beware, these images are generally posed and can offer a slanted view of the camp and what life there was like. Once you have discovered the name of the camp or that uh, there was a camp in the area, it is worth doing an internet search. At the 100th anniversary of the First World War, people began to explore in more detail the war experience. Many academics have published articles on different aspects of the war, including internment in their own countries. These articles have been published in various places, including archives, 1914-1918 online, and by organizations. Again, I would offer a word of caution, as some of the scholars did not do their due diligence. It is always worth finding the information in more than one place to make sure that it is correct. These are a few of the websites that I have personally used in my own research. The first one covers Australia, the second Canada. The next one has a lot of articles about the experience in various countries. And the last one was produced by the International Committee of the Red Cross. But be warned, a lot of their records tend to be in French. A Google search can also be helpful and it's a great place to start. Several camps have their own websites like Stobbs and Skipton. And often when you do a Google search, these are the websites that come up and they yield a lot of information, which is all digitized. So just to wrap up, these are the current projects we are working on. We are trying to gather the names of the civilian internees and prisoners of war who were at Stobbs Camp. Once we've gathered all these names, we would like to take a look at them and see their movement through the internment system so that we can learn more about how the camp network actually worked. We are also working on identifying more information about those who wrote the letters, diaries and postcards that we've discovered. I'll be talking more about all of this information, particularly the individuals and how to find them, in my talk later in the year, so keep your eyes open for an announcement. And that's all I have to say. So if anyone has any questions. Awesome. Thanks for the presentation, Hannah. Um, we'll now turn it over to the audience for any questions that you might have. So if you have any questions for Hannah, who is here right now with us, um, then please post them in the chat box and she can answer them for us. I just thought I'd point out, um, when it comes to the internment camps during the First World War, they tend not to be in the US as much. Uh, we've only came across one so far that was in North Carolina. But what seems to happen a lot is the US Embassy, because it was neutral, conducted a lot of surveys on the camps. So they're the ones that gave us reports on how many prisoners were there, what their food was like, what nationalities they were. So they were another organization that would conduct inspections of the camps. We actually have a question from Colby, it looks like. It says, is there information like this for camps in other countries that held British persons? I've not explored that as much, but the International Committee of the Red Cross, you can search it by nationality. And I believe they hold information on British individuals as well, because they were, they were a neutral organization, so they worked in all of the countries that were at war. So that would probably be the, the best place to start looking. And you can search that by their names as well. Any last questions from the audience? Okay. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Hannah, and for recording that webinar for us.
just like to remind everyone about our upcoming webinar on Monday, May 4th. Um, that's this upcoming Monday at 4 p.m. And that's with James Tanner, How to Analyze Genealogical Sources. So we hope you join, uh, hope you join us for that. And Colby, yes, this, this was recorded and I'll upload it by Monday. And it'll be on YouTube and on our website. So hopefully you can join us next time for our next webinar and hope you have a great day.